Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the show All Day Edify. I'm your host, Corey, with my wife, your co-host, Tasha. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us on today. So today's show, we're going to have a really good show today. We're actually going to be doing a series of episodes that's going to be geared towards men. And the title of it is The Mindset Change for Men. And so today's episode is going to be talked about how, when, and why men change their minds. Yes, how, when, and why men change their minds. And so I guess with this show today, babe, I guess I'm going to be interviewing you in that regard. And so what we were doing is, you know, we were developing some data that we felt like would be very helpful to this discussion. Absolutely. What we actually found is that fatherless children are five times more likely to, number one, uh, live in poverty, number two, fail a grade, and number three, have emotional problems throughout their life. We also found that fatherless children have a high incarceration rate. A lot of people who are incarcerated go years without having any connection to a person who is actually their biological father or father figure in their lives. We discovered as well that 50% of children from broken homes uh, you know, are, go a year or so without seeing their father, as well as the fact that one third of all babies born in the United States are born to single mothers. So uh, aside from even that, we also find that even in just in the city of Detroit, about 71% of the children that live in Detroit live in single parent homes. Now, this is a study where uh, of the top 25 populated cities in the country, Detroit was number one in terms of fatherless children, with 59% of them being uh, led by head of households that are women and 12% of them being led by households that were men. Now, much credit goes to both the men and women who make up that balance because it's a tough job raising a child on your own. But it is a big deal that men only hold 12 percent of that. And there's a lot of room for improvement. Absolutely. I mean, I totally agree with you um, in that regard. And so what we did see is we've seen um, we're going to talk about when we're talking about the mindset change for men. Mm -hmm. We're looking at some um, information in regards to um, the male's fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And so. What we discovered here is, you know, the fixed mindset says failure is the limit of my abilities, where the growth mindset says failure is an opportunity to grow. You know, the fixed mindset says I can either do it or I can't. And then the growth mindset says I can learn to do anything I want. And so we're kind of seeing a pattern here. And then Mm -hmm. the fixed mindset says I take feedback and criticism personal but the growth mindset says feedback is constructive. Absolutely. And, and if we look at that and, and just think about the fact that the word personal there anytime, because I think that failure is so many times associated with uh, rejection or it's taken personal because it's a way of saying that you're not achieving your goals. Uh, another thing that's discovered here is it says that uh, people who have a fixed mindset don't like challenges, whereas individuals who embrace um, growth or having a growth mindset say challenges help me to grow because they create opportunities for creativity and ingenuity to take place and I can make progress that way. Um, A a person with a fixed mindset also says that I'm going to stick to what I know. In other words, I want to stay in my comfort zone because when I venture out and take challenges, I'm met with failure sometime, which feels like rejection. Um, But at the same time, a person with a growth mindset says, I like to try new things because, again, they create new opportunities. And lastly, uh, my potential is predetermined. This is the thought process of a person with a fixed mindset, that my growth potential is predetermined, whereas a person with a growth mindset says that my potential and abilities are determined both by my effort and by my attitude. 
And so these are all things that a person with a growth mindset is able to progress beyond where a person who is stymied in their development or their ability to take risks because they've been met with failure and defeat on several occasions. Wow, that's 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 really deep. And so to me, when we, when we looked at that slide, it seems like there was a common denominator, you know, between the fixed and the growth mindset. And it seems like there was a common denominator of there being an absence of fathers in mm -hmm. each of the stats. So why do you think that that is kind of the, the, the common denominator in that? Well, I believe that a part of it is that the inner city youth, youth who grow up um, limited to uh, the motivational examples that they see, people who are demonstrating a growth mindset, all of a sudden we're, you know, we're a product of our environment many times. Right. And so until we get to the point to where we understand that I can impact change in my own life, for the most part, we're met with limited ideas uh, for growth and development. And so because it is, I believe that this is a why we see that this is a common denominator that people want to give up and just throw in the towel before they actually give themselves opportunity to grow because they don't have a lot of examples of individuals who are able to turn things around and create progress or make lemonade out of lemons. Okay. Okay. So with this topic, you know, talking about the mindset change for men. Um, so I got a couple questions for you. So my first question is, why do you believe that people see failure as an indicator that they have limited abilities or that there is a ceiling that exists concerning their potential? That's a good question, babe. I, I believe that um, for the most part, there's a lot of people who personalize failure. It's hard not to, because when you see that uh, there are challenges in front of you and you look for, say, for instance, your counterparts who you compete with in, in different areas of your life, whether it's elementary school, whether it's, you know, uh, the fact that you're trying to progress yourself um, in athletics or learning a different um, a, a preferred um, method of improving in terms of extracurricular, dance, uh, learning an instrument, you are a lot of times comparing yourself to other people. Not to say that that's healthy, but as a young child or growing up in your development, it's hard not to do that. And when you see that there are limited examples of people who can show you how to succeed, all of a sudden it's cyclical. You begin to believe that the best thing that you can do is fail. And when you do, save yourself the embarrassment, save yourself um, being ridiculed or looked at as a failure and people are resistant to the idea of continuing to work towards progress. And, and, and now that you say that, you know, I think that it takes, you know, both the male and the female in terms of making that progress and not being resistant to that. And so what is it about those challenges that cause people to be resistant and they shy away from that? Well, I think that when we talk about challenges, it's, it's like sports. I like sports a lot. I like to, you know, watch games. Um, and I always enjoyed um, competing in sports. But what I do know is that when you're faced with challenges, you know that there's opposition out there against you. And because there's opposition out there against you, you know that somebody wants to win just as much as you do. You know that somebody wants to see you lose just as much as you want to see yourself overcome them or defeat them in whatever that challenge is. And so I believe that a big part of it is that because again, we personalize failure and because we look at it as though we're up against so much, you know what I mean? We're up against uh, people who want to see us fail or people who are against us that maybe have, in our opinion, more advantages to being able to defeat us or overcome us. Then all of a sudden, if we're not careful and because it's cyclical, we start getting advice from people who have failed. We start getting deterred and discouraged by people who don't know what success look like or perseverance look like. And then the next thing you know, we feel as though the best advice that we can take is from people who say, you know what, save yourself the embarrassment and just move on to something else or stop going so hard, stop trying so hard because it's predetermined as we saw in the fixed mindset. 
And, and 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 when you talk about that as well, you know, I get into the mindset of us women um, being encouragers of those men that are trying to have a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I just know that to me, it feels like when you do see a man um, wanting to grow, um, I think that, you know, if you have a female counterpart that they're in agreement with, soon as you see that growth, taking place trying to be edifying to that man and give more encouragement so they can push forward in that regard absolutely and, and that plays such a big part being able to have somebody who's in your corner somebody who is conditioning themselves and demonstrating to you that they are committed to your success in your growth that means that you have somebody who is sharing a different perspective somebody who is offering some encouragement to you and somebody who sometimes if they care about you is pushing you and challenging you to get outside of your comfort zone, which really reminds me of the fact that that's the relationship that me and my wife have. And we wrote a book about it, you know, and, and we encourage people to read it if you get an opportunity to do so. But this isn't about that. What it's actually about is focusing on the fact that you and whoever is right there, I like to say in that foxhole with you, because, you know, in the military, that's the way we look at things. Like if somebody's in the foxhole with you, that means that both of you are trying to keep on firing your way out of there, keep on throwing punches until you're able to overcome and you can live to talk about it later. Yeah, that was a challenge for us. And but we overcame it and we were able to achieve some success. Wow. OK, so I do have another question for you. So today in 2021, what does a growth mindset look like to you? Mm. For me, a growth mindset looks like, uh, and that's a good question, babe. Um, a growth mindset looks like I have progressed today or I have made some steps because all we can do is take baby steps. I've made some baby steps today. I've progressed a little. But at the end of the day, I saw some areas where I can improve. And this is what we talk about. Uh, being able to receive feedback or constructive criticism because you can have a great day. Things can go awesome for you one day, but you always, unfortunately, you know, you can't give yourself too much credit because you're trying to balance it out, which we should. You shouldn't too, you shouldn't get too high up on the highs or sink too low when things don't go right. But you're always looking back and you're accepting um, constructive criticism and feedback that says, yes, you did good. This was progressive for us, but here's some areas that you can improve in. And in 2021, for me personally, for me personally, that's what I, that's how I evaluate and look at a growth perspective. Like, man, I saw some areas that I could improve in. Why do I want to improve? Or why am I so critical about uh, what I've done, even though I've gotten good results? Because I got people that I want to see progress beyond me. My children, I have two daughters. My wife, I want her to be successful. Uh, the people who I have leadership responsibilities over, um, I want to see them progress and I want them to get the best version of me performing in a way that demonstrates for them that although challenges are there, we can overcome that and you have my support in doing it. And so if I demonstrate that, if I'm showing them that I possess a growth mindset and I'm always looking for progress, I believe that encourages people. Again, we talked about children not having that demonstration. If we're able to do that, I believe that encourages people to think, to believe, to have a thought process that there are some opportunities, even in challenges, even in uh, being met with difficulty and failure. There's some opportunities for me to progress and move forward so that my tomorrow or even later on today produces better results than yesterday did. OK, so what do you think about this? What do you think about how the world is today? So within the last couple of years or so, we've been dealing with um, challenges in regards to males, not just African-Americans, but other, um, you know, just different demographic of people in ages and, you know, things like that to where males have been targeted in that regard. And I don't know if that plays a part in them having a different type of growth mindset because, mm -hmm. you know, it just may seem like things regarding to males, now they got their guards up, they don't know what to say, they don't know what to do when they're going out in the world. Um, how could that kind of help with, you know, men encouraging other men and being open to mm -hmm. being able to 
kind of take that stigma away to where, you know, not thinking that, you know, everybody is against men. Gotcha. You know, I think that, and my wife and I, we had a chance to, as a lot of things have evolved in the last year and a half, um, we've had an opportunity to look at, and when you sit and every time you, you know, click channels and you're watching TV and you're spending an extended time at home in one another's company, and you're seeing all these things take place, I think that it provided for women, and I know it did for my wife, it provided people with some insight as to, wow, this is what, it, this is what it's like to be a man all the time. This is what you guys go through all the time. Um, fortunately, I'm really grateful for the fact that I have two daughters and moving forward, there's a lot more opportunities. So I can see my daughters, man, they're, they're both intelligent. They're, they're both uh, beautiful young ladies who have a determination and a tenacity about life. I can foresee them having a great future because we're living in a day where greater opportunities are being created for women. And that's a plus. But I think that many times men tend to look at it as though um, it's a further attack on their opportunities to be able to grow and to be able to maximize their ability to be able to stand up and say that I am the head of the household. I lead my family and I'm going to lead us into a progressive direction. However, at the same time, there's more opportunities being created for my wife or other women around me. And that's threatening. And unfortunately, I think that sometimes it results in a combative um, approach that people take in relationships. Your wife getting more opportunities than you are, all of a sudden you feel like um, there is some proof that people feel as though, man, I have to show that she's not above me and that I wanna take my rightful place in our household and in society. And it can be threatening if you don't have a woman who's supporting you in your effort to progress. And so this is the challenge that we face as we look to develop a mindset for growth and development as men. And, and that's and that's a good point that you make, because that's why I said too um, previously that I think that us as women, when we do have men in our lives that are trying to grow, to yes. stay encouraging, to make sure that we're able to continue to keep that going because I think that only helps the male. Either we can make them or we can break them. And I Absolutely. believe that being in a male's corner, especially when they're trying to grow, is definitely a benefit, not just to you, but he can be a benefit to others and things like that. And so I just really feel like, you know, being in a in a male's corner, encouraging and pushing them in the right direction will only make a big difference positively in their lives and in our lives. Absolutely. And so, and so can you give us an example um, of a time when growth was forced upon you rather mm. than you actually initiating it? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I can honestly say that uh, in my in my lifetime, you know, sometimes we look at different things and we don't necessarily as we're going through them, we don't see it as growth potential. Um, you know, it don't always feel good to grow. You know what I mean? Um, in order to, for growth to take place, there has to be, yeah, you need sunshine for that to happen, but you also need rain uh, to fall. And so I, I would say that one of the things that come from my, to mind for me, and this is kind of directly related to this topic that we're having, is that um, I grew up for most of my life without my father. Um, I think that a lot of people can say the same thing. Again, the statistics that we shared reflect that. Um, but I was the oldest of my siblings. Uh, I was older than all of my cousins, uh, with you know, exception of one. Uh, and for the most part, um, because my mother raised me um, struggling, um, I, I think that it forced me to take a position of being able to lead by example. In fact, she talked to me about that a lot when I was growing up, is that whatever your brother and sister do, you're going to do that. Too. They're, whatever you do, they're going to do that also. And so right. there were some things that I was conscious of that I can't do. There are some opportunities, uh, even being led by peer pressure or whatever, it always caused me to be conscious of, I can't do that. Because guess what? I care about the people who are close to me who are in my heart. And so because of that, it causes you, and parents, this is something that you should think about, that when we make decisions in our lives, we put our children in a place to where yeah, we might look at it as though it helps them to grow up faster, but there are some other, some other aspects to that too. Um, you have to be careful of some bitterness growing there, uh, some resentment towards 
uh, parents or family members who you, you know, are looking at it as though like, man, it don't have to be this hard if I can get a little bit more help. So these are things that young people um, think about as they are put in tough situations and forced to have to overcome and grow up and mature because of their parents' decision making. Now, in many cases, we don't have a lot of options. Again, we just got to make some lemonade out of them limits. And so we always want to focus on ways that we can improve despite the circumstances. I'll give you another example if I could, if that's all right, babe. Yeah, um, we got a couple minutes. <laughs> okay, gotcha. The fact that um, I, um, you know, when I had my first child, when I had my first child, um, you know, I was living irresponsibly, living a street life and doing things that quite easily could have had me in, pen, you know, in, in the penitentiary and, and, and in prison, which was something that many of us, we grow up having family members that, again, we talk about that fixed mindset. We think that's our potential. We think that's our ceiling just because we have family members, friends or parents that spend a lot of time away from us and, and in, you know, incarcerated and things like that. So and subconsciously and even being put out there in words that people speak to us, we begin to think that that's the ceiling of our potential. But it's when we change our thought process. For me personally, uh, having my father be absent in my life made me determine that when I become a parent, I'm not going to do things in a certain way. And so even though it may seem optional or that I'm initiating some change in that situation or in those circumstances, it's not because the way that I'm wired, being there to provide for my children is something that I prioritize. And it's not always easy to do. Um, I had some, you know, some things that I had to overcome. And but again, being a parent caused me to grow up. Why? Because guess what? Children don't ask to come here. That when they're brought here into the earth, all of a sudden a parent's mindset set should change. Your mindset should become that my Total existence is about progressing life, my situation, so that they benefit from it. And so as parents, we have to have that mindset and it forces us to grow up. And, and I totally agree with you in that regard. I believe um, that if you do um, have a child or children and you're actually taking on that responsibility on a day to day basis, um, or if you're caring for children or adoption or anything like that, that's a that's a big pill to swallow and it's a big responsibility yes, and it, it should have you you know it should force you to have a different mindset whether you are a male or a female and so um in that regards i totally agree and so i think we have time for one more question okay so so how can you tell when it's time to grow or move on from the status quo man i tell you uh i i'll refer to uh, something that was often said, you know, like when I was growing up, we used to just put it like, you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. But I, I think the another way that it's it's put in, you know, is that, you know, we always talk about, and you hear people say it more often, that, um, you know, the definition or the meaning of insanity is to continue to do things a certain way, but expecting different results. You keep bumping your head up against the wall and you like, well, man, why is this, why is my head hurting? Why are you expecting that your head is not going to hurt if it keeps hurting every time you bump your head up against the wall? And so I think that the indicator for us that the status quo is no longer acceptable and I need to do something real quick to change things. I think that we reach a point to where we feel as though we're not satisfied with or we're not pleased with the results that we're getting. We're not getting the results that we want. We're not progressing at a rate that we want. We're not generating opportunities for growth. Uh, the way that we would like to see them. We see people progressing. And again, it's not about competing because you only want to be the best version of yourself. But if you feel as though your potential is greater or you maybe later in life or at some point beyond your childhood, you start seeing that there is a capacity that people I feel as though are around me are achieving, then guess what? I want to reach for that. That's motivation many times. I'm really grateful you know, for my wife being in my life that there's so many things that she encourages me to do. And I try to do the same thing for her, to encourage her so that we can say to ourselves, like, you know what, babe, it's time for us to move on and progress beyond this. And we've gone through quite a bit of change in the time that we've been together. But for you as an individual, knowing how much the people that are in your life matter to you and how much you care about them, when you start feeling as though you're not getting the results that you want and that you feel they deserve, oh, it's time for a mindset change. 
It's time to do some things differently so you can get to a point to where you have a greater deal of appreciation or you have a greater uh, level of accomplishment that you want to uh, give yourself credit for or feel as though you are providing greater opportunities for the people you love that are close to you. Wow. Wow. That's great. And so I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, these series of episodes that we're going to be talking about and interviewing different guests um, in regards to mindset change for men. So uh, with that in mind, at this time, we're going to go ahead and bring this particular segment to a close. And so we want you to just tune in to our next episode and the future episodes of our show, All Day Edify, where we aim to uplift, inform, and enlighten you. All day, every day. Do you provide human services? Are you an entrepreneur that contributes to society? Do you have access to tools and resources that facilitate growth and development? Come be a guest on our show. You can email us at alldayedify at gmail.com or send us a message on our Facebook page at All Day Edify. From the great city of Flint, Michigan, Sundial Networks presents Live at the Golden Link with the Eclipse Band featuring the stars of tomorrow and amateur night with history in the making open mic. Watch the TV show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Search us on Roku under Sundial Network. Also available on most smart TVs. On the web at www.sundial.tv. That's sundial.tv. No subscription needed. Watch the TV show with the Eclipse Band featuring the stars of tomorrow. Only on the Sundial Network. Search us on Roku under Sundial Networks every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. That's Sundial.tv. Watch the TV show every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. www.sundial.tv. The TV Talk Show. The TV Talk Show. The TV Talk Show. The TV Talk the TV Show. Talk Game, Talk of show. Life. Game of Life. Game of Life. Game Hosted of life. by the, the real, OG. real OG. The real OG. You can watch it every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 7 p.m. at www.sundial.tv. In the Game of Life, you're going to get knocked out, get knocked down. Ain't nobody going to be there to pick you up. Mama, not going to be there to... Hold your hand all the time. Daddy ain't gonna be there to, to shield you all the time. We done went insane. When you done go insane, you don't even know certain things that you do. Real OG is gonna give it to you raw and uh, in your face, you know what I mean? What's gonna be your, your what and your why? You know what I'm saying? What is it that's gonna get you motivated? Don't forget my haters, y'all know what it is. Catch up on past episodes on YouTube. Search Sundial Networks, TV show, Game of Life. Hey, it's me, Sonya. Check me out Tuesdays and Thursdays between 8 and 9, and at 7 Central, while I host Top 10 from the Streets on HiD.TV. Yes. And you can also search us under High Dimension Networks on Roku. Check me out. Please join me, no other than, on That's My Jam, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 6 to 7 p.m. and on Saturdays, 2 to 4 p.m. on www.hid.tv. You can also download High Dimension Networks on the Roku channel. See you there. Hi, I'm BJ. And I'm Noon. We're, We're the, the proud, proud owners of BJ and Noon's Noon Barbecue. Located at G5034 Clyde Road, Flint, Michigan. We serve lamb chops, we serve ribs, we serve ribs, we serve fish, we serve chicken, we serve dressing, macaroni and cheese, 
all of your soul food. Carry out, dine in. You can even call at 810-820-7369. We will always appreciate your business. Liberty Tax. Tax preparation done right. Bring it in and we'll handle it. Located at 3046 West Pearson Road in Flint, Michigan, 48504. Call us at 810-221-0285. Let our friendly staff members put you first. Our service includes individual tax return preparation, small business tax returns and preparation, prior year returns, amended tax returns and we also offer free checking of tax returns come on in and see what we can do for you thank you in advance hello and thank you for joining us for another episode of all day edify the show where we're your yeah. host, Corey and Natasha Feimster yeah that's right and of course our aim is just to inform uplift and enlighten you all day every day that's right. And so today's topic, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about why mental health is so important. Absolutely. Mental health care is extremely valuable. And we have some some data that we want to share with you that kind of adds some understanding as to why this is so significant. If you take a look at it, there is a high percentage of adults aged 18 and over who had received medication, medical treatment, as well as um, receiving counseling or therapy from a mental health professional in the past 12 months. And if you can see here, that number variates in different age groups, 18 to 44. Then there's another age group, 45 to 64. And lastly, our seniors, 65 years and over. There's also data that supports the idea that there is a difference in gender in terms of these services being provided by for individuals that are 18 and older. The difference is that you'll see, again, people who are receiving mental health tre treatment, taking medication, as well as receiving counseling or therapy services. And as the indicator shows here with this graph, the number is extremely higher for females compared to male counterparts, all right? And then the other thing that we want to point out to you is that there's a difference with people's um, background in terms of what their race or nationality is in terms of them receiving these services. As we can see with individuals who are uh, Hispanic, non-Hispanic whites, excuse me, non-Hispanic whites being a lot higher than their Hispanic and their black counterparts. And so there's a lot to read in between that. However, it's very obvious that there is a difference between who is actually receiving these services, who is actually taking medication, and then at the same time, uh, who actually needs these services. And so to talk about that a little bit more, we have a guest with us who is a subject matter expert. That's right. So our our guest for today is none other than Jamel Jefferson, who happens to have his own practice. He's a licensed professional counselor. Hey, Jamel, how are you? Thank hey, you. Hey, Jamel, how you doing? Hey, everybody. I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me. Good, good. Good to have you with us. Now, we're talking about this topic and we share some data that a lot of the indicators are that maybe there are some people who view and understand the significance of having strong mental health care while others don't. Could you expound on that a little bit? <laughs> yes. Um, what, what your data shows is that there's a disparity between the groups and actually between people who receive mental health services or we seek them out. Um, the problem is that we find out that a lot of cultural teachings will sway people one way or the other. Um, we're out here with mental health now in this climate, especially with COVID and a lot of things are coming up that it's becoming even more evident to take care of your mind. One thing is that we see people going to take care of physical health, but there is a problem with that when you just take care of the body and not take care of the mind, because the, as we know that the mind is the central processing unit of the body. So the mind tells the body what to do, not the other way around. And a lot of what I've come to find out most time in this country is that we're big and it's okay to go get physical health, but when you start talking about mental health, it becomes taboo. Um, you, people get labeled as crazy. I know I tell a lot of people that come see me, there's no such thing as a crazy person in therapy. I, I like to tell them, I say, hey, the crazy people are the ones sitting around outside talking about they don't have any problems knowing that they really do. So how can you be crazy when you understand that you have a deficit or an issue and you actually seek out help to rectify that? Very good. Good point. Now, before we put the cart ahead of the horse, which I've already done, so you have to excuse me. 
If you could, please, Jamel, tell us a little bit about your background, some of your experience that led to you being um, in this place that you are today. Uh, that's funny. People ask me to say, how did you become a counselor? Um, honestly, I was tricked. I tell people that I was tricked because my bachelor's is in financial planning, concentration investments. I went to school with dreams and hope actually to be an accountant. And I ended up watching a movie uh, called Wall Street. And next thing you know, I wanted to be an investment banker. So I was easy to switch. So I did eight years in the business world. And in 2005, when I accepted my call into the ministry, I was actually going to seminary to get a master's degree in divinity. I had no clue or idea what counseling was or what it looked like. But unfortunately, since I didn't do some things properly, I had to go to school on probation. And Ashland Theological Seminary was the only school that took me in on probation. And actually, they admitted me to the Christian education program until I proved myself. During my first year there, I realized, uh, took part in a class and where somebody was start talking to me about counseling. And I, I didn't have any clue. But I did remember that it was a word of prophecy that went forth that said I'd be a counselor. Lo and behold, I applied to the counseling program. I got admitted right away, not on probation. So that was the indicator. Um, then actually one day, second semester, second year, first semester of my, um, my schooling, I remember one Monday night I was working doing transportation logistics at C.H. Robinson. And I was kind of angry that night in group. And I prayed that night. I said, God, I just want a job to where my gifts and talents can be utilized and I can be who I'm supposed to be. Monday night, Tuesday, I went to work and got fired. So I couldn't get a job for two years until I completed my degree. My classes ended in 2010, August 28th. September 1st, I had a job working in child welfare to start the process of where I was going and where I'm ended up today. So it's it's God ordained. I can't gotcha. say nothing, nothing else about that because this was not even on my radar. So that's what I tell people. So from there, I ended up doing child welfare for a few years. Then I did uh, community mental health where I was working at the Children's Center doing home-based therapy. Then I transitioned from there to Easter Seals where I did uh, inpatient, not inpatient, um, substance abuse groups for teens as well as outpatient in-office therapy. And from there, I branched off into private practice and then I was able to establish my own private practice after that. Very good, very good. So, so with that in mind, so that's kind of all encompassing. So. And with this topic and this lifestyle, why does that mean so much to you? It seems like you've grown a passion for it, considering you switched kind of your majors. Um, so why does this topic and lifestyle, you know, providing this service mean so much to you? Because one of my passions, one of my, one of my heartstrings is helping people to be who they're supposed to be, to achieve healing. And and that avenue, you have to understand what's really going on inside of you, where you're at, even your identity or just even stressors in life. So it's really important because we're out here in the world struggling with a whole lot of things that we're not able to get assistance with. And a lot of times we don't even know what it is. I, would, I can coin it as dysfunctional behaviors. We have these habits, these behaviors mm -hmm. that are not meeting the needs of what we're actually trying to get, but it's actually causing us more harm. And but we're only doing what we know to do that's best to try to deal with our pain to deal with our issues so where is that safe place to where you can go and deal with your stuff without i, I said without the fear of hearing it across the pulpit without the fear of seeing it on social media without mm -hmm. the fear of hearing it at the family barbecue that's the therapy process so there's mm -hmm. a safe place where people can come work through their stuff and then as they gain tools and be able to grow and develop, they can go out and help other people. So that's the process with this. So it's really important to me because I want to see people become healed and become who God has actually called them to be and be the best version of themselves they can be. Absolutely. Helping people live their best life, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm, I'm looking and I want to go back to a, a data point where we identify with, based on this research that is made available to us, um, that women seem to be a little more likely, in fact, significantly more likely to seek out mental health services than men are. Uh, what is the stigma with that? Or why do we think that is? Ah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. It's, it's, the, it's okay to get help. For women, women are taught from birth that it's okay to express their emotions and feelings, to talk about things. That's how they get quote unquote labeled as emotional. 
Um, and I like to teach my men that we're just as emotional as women. But there is this upbringing that us, us men are taught that one, emotions are a sign of weakness. Crying is a sign of weakness. Anything other than being some tough dude out here working through everything and not showing any emotions and not dealing with any pain is weakness. And that's the part that now we're finding out that it, it's we're debunking that myth because we're equipped the same way. We feel the same way. We have a lot of the same issues, but it's OK for one set to deal with it. But it's taboo for the other. So that's why you don't see a lot of men talking about stuff. That's why you see us as angry. That's why you see a whole lot of health issues, because that's all that stuff internalized is causing it to materialize in many different ways, i.e. heart attacks, high blood pressure, stress, strokes, mental illnesses, disease. It's a lot of that because it's, we, we, we're just stuffing it all on the inside of us and there is no release point. And that's where you see the differences, because, again, let a lady say, hey, I'm going to get some help. Be like, OK, girl, go ahead. That's so nice. You get a dude out here like, man, what's wrong with you? Are you a punk? You saw that Absolutely. becomes the stigma. And I see that a lot, too. I see a lot of young guys and I see older guys, too. They sometimes they ask for or try to reach out um, in a general aspect saying, you know, they would like to receive mental services. But when you present that to them, they're kind of like, you know, not really wanting to engage in that factor. Is there a different approach that should be taken in that manner in terms of trying to get the men to really seek those services to get the help that they need? Yes, there becomes a conversation that we have to, to have with people and let them know that it's okay to get help. Um, I love to use the analogy about tutoring. Mm -hmm. um, I have a younger daughter who I ended up having to put in tutoring to get some reading comprehension help. Uh, I, I live in the Rochester Hills area and it was really kind of disheartening. I felt really bad like I felt my daughter when I had to get her tutoring. I didn't understand the concept because in my mind, Tutoring was for dummies. Mm. That that was the that was the deal. So I'm riding one day and I hear this Kuman commercial, and it's like, no, only smart people come to Kuman, and it really baffled the mess out of me. I was like, smart people go to tutoring. I'm confused. So I asked my wife. I was like, well, who's there? And she talked about the Asians, the other communities. And I was like, hold on, wait a minute. Those are the people we go to as our doctors. They got all the good jobs. Huh? They getting help? Hmm. What's up with this? So that's when it led me to believe, really research and look at it. It's like, wait a minute, getting help and getting assistance is not dumb or stupid. It's smart because you have to use the resources available to you in order to move forward. It's not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength to maybe recognize something and then be able to move forward. And that was the that was the moment that I really started understanding, like, wait a minute, there's resources available to us. We just have to utilize them so we can be better. And I think that's the speech. And then what, what really I see a lot in my practice, because I have an abundance of men that come see me, is that the conversation when my boy told me, man, he, he came to therapy and it changed his life. So that now becomes the narrative. If we change the narrative and start, I'm going to use testifying about the goodness of counseling right. and how it can help you, it shifts people because how do you, why do you buy a product? It's because somebody has told you, man, you need to check this out. Right. Or you see it somewhere and you like, man, that's awesome. How does that work? And then somebody talks about it. So mm -hmm. once you start changing the narrative around, it's OK to get help. It's OK to go to counseling. It's OK to enlist assistance. It's OK to go lay on somebody's couch and talk about your problems. Mm -hmm. That's when things will begin to shift, because if it still is taboo or something you got to do in secret, a lot of people will shame away from it. Gotcha. And you bring up a good point. And again, I want to refer back to the statistical data that we talked about earlier, where we talk about how it is that Hispanics versus non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic blacks, according to this, and it's important to point out that this is the National Health Interview Survey, National Health Interview Survey, and they're speaking with and surveying uh, U.S. civilian non-institutionalized people. So these are people that are somewhere institutionalized. These are normal people who are admitting that they have issues, they take medication, um, and they are seeking out treatment to get better. You talked about the tutoring, and this applies in mental health care as well. Could you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, it's the same aspect as tutoring, as being able just to look out and get help. But like I said, what it is, what's in our culture that we are being taught? 
different cultures teach different things. So if it's if it's acceptable in your culture to go get help, then you're more likely to go do it. However, in the black community, it's shamed upon, it's looked upon. Remember uncle so-and-so who was in the back room, yeah, just take his plate, but going back there, you know something wrong with him. That's the problem. Hey, go get some help. I've heard many a times that, hey, well, my mom and them said ain't nothing wrong with me. I don't need no counseling. Counseling is for crazy people. That's the narrative that is being spun in our community that is not being spun in other communities. They are encouraging you to go get help, to go talk to people. Unlike our, our Caucasian partner, they're encouraged to go to counseling. They go do all, all the, it's like, wait, what's going on? Why, why are they a little bit better off? Because they're willing to use the resources. Absolutely. You know, we Absolutely. struggle. Why? Because we don't want to use the resources available to them because we have made, again, I'm keeping using the word taboo. We have made it taboo for this. We have made it to where we have to suffer in silence. And that's the detriment to us is that nobody's nobody wants to get help to carry our stuff hmm. when it's we want to carry it all by ourselves. When it's people standing there willing and ready to say, hey, we can help that with you. Well, gotcha. well, no talk rules in the house. Well, go on in the house, stay in the house. We don't talk about it again. Hmm. That's where we're hiding all this shame. That's really how the enemy is kicking our butts. It's because we're doing it all by ourselves. But what happens when we list when we list help is that now we're shining lights in areas and now we got support. So mm. you just can't be kicking my butt by myself. Mm -mm, gotcha. I got my boys with me. So that changes the narrative. So that's the part of this. Gotcha. We got to change that narrative. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I did notice one thing um, in terms of mental health. Um, it's been on the rise, especially um, it's been on the rise before COVID. Um, but really, definitely to me, it seems like since COVID has hit mental health, um, the need for mental health services has really been on the rise. Now, there's a big topic in regards to how this whole COVID and trying to deal with that. So we'll get into the whole how your services have been impacted. But the first thing is, the increase in the services because when COVID, of course, we're still in this pandemic, a lot of people are losing loved ones. And mm. so they're trying to deal with that because it's not just one person, maybe you know, a loved one a year or something like that. It's multiple. They're losing them mm -hmm. at an increased rate. So how are you dealing with that factor in terms of, have you seen an increase in the services that you're providing um, in, in your practice? Um, as far as the grief and loss or anxiety or depression related to the COVID, because that's two different, that's two different areas. Um, because- So, so it, would, it would be kind of like the anxiety um, in terms of, you know, no one knows what to do. They don't know if they're going to be next and how to specifically deal with all of these loved ones, you know, that they're losing at a rapid pace, you know, and trying to mm -hmm. support, you know, each other. But then they don't know how to be of a support because they need support. So mm -hmm. that's kind of, you know, the anxiety piece and how to actually deal with that. Right. Well, that's part of that is, is understanding that um, you can't help anybody if you can't stand up. Mm -hmm. So um, I teach a lot about self-care. So in order to support other people, you have to first take care of yourself. Um, because I know if I go to lean on somebody and you can't stand up, I got a problem. Uh, but that's part of this. And it's just being able, having that open door to be able to talk about people, talk about these things and understand what's really going on and, and even understanding what can you control and what can't you control. Um, one of the biggest ways that people are really coping with this is with faith. Um, I'm a, my, my office is Christian based, but I've worked with people who with different faith backgrounds. And you talk about, well, what are you utilizing to help you get through this? Because in the natural, it's tough, but where's your higher power that allows you to sustain? And that mm -hmm. for me, it's God. Um, I, I know no other way, it, the peace, <laughs> that surpasses all understanding is what has helped me to deal with a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it's I turn to my faith because that's that's all I know. And, and, and you know, people I'm working with, with with the same backgrounds, when they come to me, we talk, hey, how are you leaning on God in the middle of this? Because there's a lot of uncertainty. But the question is, is that, you know, like I said, we don't know whether we're coming or going. We don't know when our time is going to be. But the question is, are you doing 
what you can for your life today. And, 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 and if you really are struggling with the loss of people, it's really showing you in this time that people matter, relationships matter. And have you done the necessary things to keep in touch and connecting? Mm. Because it, it hurts to all of a sudden say you look up and somebody's gone, but yet you have an art against them mm. or you got some beef that was never resolved. So right. now it's at this point is that I, I need to start tightening up some of these relationships. Mm. I need to start speaking to people if I ain't spoke to them or guess what? You know, it, it me and a couple of my friends and I is big that we tell each other we love us. Man, you know, I love you, dog. I, I love you. You know, you my mans. We give you your flowers bef before you leave Absolutely. the earth. And that, that's letting people know how significant they are to you. Even if I don't talk to you every day, let me just let you know you matter to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a part of this is that, you know, this whole piece is fear based, but God has not given us the spirit of fear. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I need I need to combat this with something because the world is going to give you one thing. But what is your defense against that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, I agree. It's very important to have a a default system in place, or if you're really being proactive about your mental health, about your spirituality, it's not a default for you. It is your go-to. It is your initial uh, step that you take to for sustainment, all right? I noticed something too, um, in the middle of all of this and in speaking with you today, uh, you happen to have, there's another group that's not included in the statistical, uh, any of these categories, but I know of another group that really needs some therapy. And it's the Detroit Lions fans. I see a, a Lions helmet there. Hey, you show, see man. three of them. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, listen. I understand I'm a Lions fan. Gotcha. So if you're not a Lions fan, you don't want this smoke today. Gotcha. I can talk about my team being bad, but you can't. Gotcha. Gotcha. I know what's wrong. I know what we're going through. We go. We going to have faith and keep them in prayer. Hey, hey, gotcha. let, let, it, it's okay. They're yeah. going to be all right. You yeah, know, I, yeah. in my lifetime, we go into the ship. I, I believe that, <laughs> gotcha, you gotcha. know, but it, it's yeah, it's some stuff I haven't had to stop doing with them because they were stressing me out. Come on, talk about that. <laughs> I tell you, I stopped watching them on Sundays, man. I'm a Lions fan too, but I started preserving myself mentally and emotionally by not putting it in front of me on Sundays. I know. Some, I there's some things we can do preventive, right? Yeah, there's preventative steps, but listen, I, I like football. And I'm partial to the Lions. So if I ain't watching the Lions game, it feels really weird. Right. So it, I understand what I'm about to walk into. Gotcha. <laughs> right. As long as so you th this, this is where it starts. Gotcha. I prepare myself because I know what's about to jump off. Gotcha. So when it happens, I'm not shocked. I don't go in there with all these hopes and dreams and these false expectations mm -hmm. because disappointment is nothing but unmet expectations. Absolutely. So I've learned how to temper my expectations. Mm -hmm. And now I've said, I just need the Lions to compete. If they show up and compete, I'm happy. Because first of all, you ain't just going to come in here and just be punking us and think we, hey, when your schedule come out, you automatically writing W's and L's. When the Lions say you just put an automatic W behind, no, nah, that ain't cool. Right, no, right. You're right. going to come in here and get some of this. And it, hey, you're going to leave out, like my man said, uh, kneecap going to get bit off of something. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, you ain't just going to come in here and think this is just an easy win. So I'm happy with that. And I understand the culture, the atmosphere, and what's changing. So I really don't expect them to be good. Next year, uh, I got different expectations because now brand new regime, things are changing. It's a little different. So there's this little bit of ups and downs. Gotcha. There's some wins we're going to get. There's some losses we probably shouldn't have. But I, I need to see consistency in how you play and the changing of the culture. Okay, Absolutely. so one I last agree. question before we run out of time. So I know we were talking about COVID and everything like that. So with your services, I know that um, services have been virtual, telehealth, um, mm -hmm. you know, not in person. And some people are kind of biased against wanting to just be in the office. They don't want to talk to somebody on the phone. They don't mm -hmm. want to do virtual. Some people don't even know how to use virtual services they say i don't know how to do that you know but they want to just be able to have that one-on-one -on -one. so how has those services impacted and what are you guys doing in your practice to kind of you know go through that process my office has been 100 percent virtual um, for these reasons only because protecting us and protecting other people um i had a few people at first who did not like the virtual 
but I had started implementing it before. But once we went, uh, once COVID hit and we shut it down, people have been more receptive to it. And it's been easy to take the change. I know there are some folks who still demanding it, but um, for me, setting healthy boundaries and even protecting my household, I've just decided not to go back until some of this blows off. And it's becoming more effective. And I, I've actually, a lot of my people are benefiting from it and they're totally happy with it. And some people are like, well, I ain't coming back. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. But then there's others that say, when you open them doors back, I'll be right back in there. So it, it's, it's just a new dynamic and it's a temporary. Mm -hmm. So as, if you're effective, you're effective. Um, and this is the way I do it to say, we're looking at each other like this. So if I got to sit in the office with a mask on and all that, it already puts a barrier between us. So how can we do this barrier free? So I can see your body, I can see your head shot, I can see your face, we can do all that. That's a new way to set it up and everybody stays safe. And that's Absolutely. a good segue for, you know, you mentioned that. Can you tell us, you know, before we let you go, um, how people can connect with you and um, some things that, you know, you want to let our viewers know in terms of your practice and how they can kind of, you know, touch base with you. Um, I have a website, which is www.envisionchainecc.com. Or you can call the office at 586-251-0408. Well, my lovely office manager will connect you and give you resources and information about our practice. Um, I do have three other clinicians in my office um, other than just me, and they're just as good as me or they wouldn't be working for me. Mm -hmm. So you can guarantee that, you know, you won't get me because it's different, but it's everybody has their own unique skill and ability, but we're all good at what we do individually and we work together as a team. So don't be afraid to reach out for help. All right. Well, that concludes another interview. I, I enjoyed that interview and yeah. uh, I look forward to connecting with him and growing even in our, you know, connecting in our relationship uh, based on so many similarities and things we have in common and being able to connect with the community. Right. Yes, that was that was awesome. I mean, the services that he's providing, um, all of the tools and statistics that we received on today, that was just a lot of good nuggets that we can take in. And so that way, I think that this will be really encouraging for a lot of men, um, not only just the women, but men too. So I really think that, you know, this is a, a stepping stone to be able to be a help to the community. Absolutely. Again, we thank you for joining us as well. Uh, tune in next time um, and all day edify the show where our aim is to inform, uplift, and enlighten you. All day every day. Do you provide human services? Are you an entrepreneur that contributes to society? Do you have access to tools and resources that facilitate growth and development? Come be a guest on our show. You can email us at alldayedify at gmail.com or send us a message on our Facebook page at All Day Edify. A new way to watch TV on the web and on Roku, the High Dimension Network. Check us out on the web at www.highd.tv. That's highd.tv on the web. And search us under High Dimension Networks on Roku. Yes, we're on the web and Roku. And we're bringing music, news, fashion, culture, and lifestyle. The line, that's my jam. Top 10 from the streets. And we know sports. New to the game, legends in music, and so much more. It's about time. Something new in TV. Brand new flavor on the web and on Roku. High Dimension Network. Check us out on the web at www.highd.tv. That's highd.tv on the web and search us on high dimension networks on roku yes we're on the web and roku high dimension networks that's h-i-g-h-d dot tv a new tv channel sundial networks showcasing urban culture music lifestyle fashion talk shows comedy movies and more tv lineups slow jams game of life Sundial Soul, live from the Smokehouse, The Battle, New Versus Old, 60s and 70s Time Machine, All That Jazz, and on Sunday, special programming with Religious Roots, Gospel Soul, R&B Classic Gospel. You can find us on the web and on most smart TVs at www.sundial.com.
Sundial.tv. That's Sundial.tv. And on Roku. Yes. Roku. Free. No subscription needed. Search for us under Sundial Networks. That's S-U-N-D-I-A-L Networks. Sundial Networks. Web TV Media is looking for marketing and salespeople. Experience or no experience, all are welcome. We're also looking for people to help with two brand new TV networks. If you've been looking for an opportunity to be a part of the entertainment industry and want to be a volunteer, volunteers and interns are also welcome. We are looking for marketing and sales people as well to work in a safe and friendly atmosphere. Please send email to webtvmedia1 at gmail.com.